Hi everyone, Pilotscape here. So, I thought I'd make a video today about the uh, Flight Sim 2020 Cup and the avionics in the Cup, the Garmin G3, uh, G3X. Uh, and the reason why I, I thought I'd do this is because uh, there's a lot of nuances to it that um, I, I was trained on old school classic steam gauges and round dials and, and lots of mechanical moving things and a lot of the avionics nowadays are new and it's a steep learning curve for me so um, some of the stuff on the game is not completely accurate to real life it's a bit uh, quirky but um, it still is good to at least have the answers out there and there were some things that I struggled with when I first started learning it um, so I thought I'd make a video just to sort of break it down and to um, not address everything in the G3X, but just to address some of the issues that I had as a, a real world commercial pilot dealing with uh, the G3X and how to work some of the basic functions of it. So I'm not here at Tacoma Narrows at my local airport and um, I'm just going to fly the pattern around a little bit just to... Um, just to give you a basic idea of how the avionics work in this particular plane and um, just some of the nuances in, of it. So, so the first thing uh, I had an issue with when I first started flying this plane was setting the barometric pressure. And I'm looking at this and I'm thinking to myself, where do I set my altimeter? I get the, you know, the backup. Okay, that's pretty pretty simple and and we all know we can just hit we can just hit B right and it'll automatically adjust all of our altimeters but how do we do it manually one of the most basic things in aviation is being able to calibrate your altimeter as soon as you get in the plane so how do we do that all right so this plane has two screens split screens it's got a PFD and um, something like a multifunction display here map and if you notice down here on the right hand knob there is nothing that says it says zoom and page select but it does not say set you know barometric pressure but if you hit full up here in the top right hand corner it'll get rid of this map and you'll notice that it now changes to course and barrow so your CDI course and your barometric pressure and this barometric pressure which is pointing to the larger outer knob is how you set your barometric pressure which is referenced in blue right here under your altimeter tape there's always the lazy person's way of just hitting B but I would like to know how to actually do this in real life so that's why I wanted to know how so on split screen you're adjusting various different things on this map in this particular you, you, particular case you're adjusting the map uh, select page flight plan procedures on full screen you're setting the altimeter next thing um, I wanted to know was how to use the autopilot and the autopilot in here is, is fairly simple but it's also kind of annoying because I, I noticed that sometimes it just turns on or it turns off or it, it you know I, I don't really know what it's doing sometimes it's a bit frustrating as well but if you understand how it's working, it makes it a little bit less frustrating. So let's go ahead and um, set it up really fast before I take off. I want to go to a heading of about uh, maybe due north west. Okay. And then I want to go up to approximately 2,000 feet. So you set the heading on the left hand knob and you set the altitude on the right hand knob. So I want to go up to two grand. Okay, and then I want to set, before I hit altitude, because this altitude does something different, if you want to go up or down to an altitude that you're not already at, you have to hit vertical speed. So before I turn this GPS on, I'm going to turn the heading on. You notice it's indicating right here that it is activated, and yet there is nothing here indicating the, uh, the autopilot is actually on, so it's not on yet flight director has now populated and if we hit vertical speed vertical speed will show up and we are going to 
spin this dial right here for the vertical speed up to maybe about 700 feet per minute which is indicated right there on the VSI tape and so we have 700 feet per minute vertical speed altitude select so once it gets up to 2,000 feet it'll hold 2,000 feet assuming that I turn the autopilot on at some point all right so let's go ahead and take this bad boy off and then we will continue on all right all right so we just need to turn the landing light on fuel pump on and we are ready to go So while we're flying outbound a little bit, I wanted to address VOR navigation. So not everybody uses VORs anymore, but I think they're extremely useful, not only to use on a routine basis, but you definitely need to know, regardless of what type of flying you're doing, you need to know how to use them. So when I first got into this plane, I had no idea how to use them at all, because as soon as you start up, it's it's assigned to the C CDI here is assigned to the GPS, and I had no idea how to change that. But after some research, I realized that you can change this CDI by clicking on it. So in the real world, you would just push the screen, you touch the screen. Once you click this, it brings you to CDI source and bearing pointers. So if I want to fly using now have one, you change this to VOR1. Now let's just say I want to bring up the, let's say, SeaTac, or no, let's, let's say Olympia, right? So Olympia is a, an airport down to the south, and the frequency for that is 113.4. So we're going to change this bearing pointer to Nav1, and we're going to go uh, this is another topic, but how do we change frequencies? Nowhere on here does it give me a nav option, nav radio option. All we have is COM1 and standby COM1. How do I do that? Okay. First of all, let's do our cruise checklist. LT. Instruments. Fuel. Time. Cruise checklist complete. All right. How do we set our nav radios? Go to your, your menu. Under your menu, you will see COM1, COM2, which is not an option up here, but it is an option on menu. Nav1 and Nav2. So you have all of your radios right Help here. Help Raptors 527 leaving my airspace frequency change approved. All right, so I'm just going to uh, change my radio so I don't have to listen to that guy. All right, nav one, we're gonna set it to Olympia 113.4. 113.4, transfer into the active frequency, 113.4, and we're gonna get out of that. So now we have our primary CDI source on the VOR. 
We also have our pointer, pointer one on nav one. Okay, and we could get rid of this if we just want to look at this, which is probably a little bit easier to look at. But well, we can leave it on. I think I'm just going to leave it on for the time being. So, how do we set our OBS? Okay, will you notice that when we're on split screen, we don't have the option to do that down here, just like the barometric pressure. But on full screen, there's our course, the center knob. All right, so now we're going to tune it just like we would a mechanical VOR. All right, so we are pretty much just due north of the Olympia VOR, and here is our DME, 26.7. And I'm not sure what the source is for that. I think it's probably just GPS, but it doesn't matter because GPS is a perfectly usable source um, for DMA, assuming that um, GPS is IFR certified. So how do we how do we identify cross radios? Good thing you asked. That was another thing that was really frustrating to me when I first started flying this particular aircraft. How the heck do I do cross radios? Because sometimes you need to figure out where you're at. Sometimes you need to figure out where another VOR is. Okay, so let's tune up Seattle, which is 116.8. So we go menu, nav 2 frequency, 116.8, transfer into the active, and then we're going to hit the CDI. For the, the HSI, and then we're going to leave this on CBI source one. I mean, we could we could even just turn this off for now. Now, delay my last. You can't turn it off. <laughs> All right. So anyway, we're going to turn this on to now two. So now we have cross radials, and you could even start sourcing from now too if you want. So Seattle, as you can see, SEA 13.5 miles. 13.5 miles. And we can set our course, which is the middle knob. Figure out what radio are we on. And there it is. We are on the 250 radio. And we are on the about the 00102 radio from Olympia. So that's how you do your courses, your cross radials, and your DME. And you can identify these navigational aids by this little box here. Or another way to do that, as we all know, is to identify it by Morse code. How do you do that? How do you listen to these navigational aids in the G3X? Well, the, up here, there's a little box that says audio, okay? And in it, you have all of your normal audio buttons. COM1, COM2, and then you have your mic on one or two. Obviously, you can only transmit on one at a time, but you can listen to multiple radios at one time, just like any other airplane. So, just like any other audio panel, you can listen to NAV1 or listen to NAV2. This speaker makes absolutely no difference. You can turn it on, but it doesn't do anything. So let's identify Olympia. Now you can't see it, but I'm actually looking at a Sky Vector, um, uh, Sky Vector map of Olympia. sure why that's not working, but it used to be working. I feel like this game is full of all kinds of little glitches and things like that that don't make a whole lot of sense to me. But um, either way, you can identify the navigational aids by looking at them visually right there. 
So let's close this audio panel and go back to split screen. All right, so how do we fly an ILS in this plane? Well, first of all, let's head it on back to Tacoma. Just get it going in the general direction. So let's tune up an ILS frequency. So the ILS frequency for Tacoma is 1091. So if you remember, we go to the menu, that one, 1091. Transfer. And as you can see, we don't have DNA anymore because we are now tracking I. TIW, which is the identifier for the ILS Tacoma. That's a bad one. So the course on that is 167. So we are going to back full the course changes to 167 around that. And I'm going to intercept that bit sharper. And what we can actually do now is we can intercept that. Uh, if we hit nav in a heading, once it starts to track it, it'll it'll hold that heading and then it'll intercept it once it starts coming in. We don't have a glide slip yet, I think, because we are too far out. But once we get in range, we'll have glide slip, and we'll be able to track that. And just like most GPSs, or sorry, just like most autopilots, when you hit heading in conjunction with approach, you can track a heading to intercept, and the approach will actually track the localizer inbound, and then once you get to the glide slope, it will track that glide slope all the way down. So I have tested this previously, and I've tested this previously, and um, works perfectly fine. So, just caught my own mistake. As you can see, the CDI source was switched to NAV2, and I switched back to localizer 1. So, if we hit approach, what it would normally do is hold that heading until it intercepts, and then track it inbound, which is exactly what it's doing. And as you can see, now we have a glide slope. So once it intercepts that glide slope at the, uh, the auto marker, we'll start to descend on that glide slope. So just a few things that I that I bring up that are not always common sense. Hope they help somebody, and I will see you around.